and into them, trusting that the one who has loved us from before the foundation of the world is with us now and with us even as we worship. So let us worship God. Good, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. God, we are surrounded by your creations, that which you call good. The evidence of your hand is everywhere we look, even as we struggle to see the beauty or feel your touch. Startle us, O oh God, with your truth. Each day we encounter your children, whom you call blessed, each one a beloved child, even though we can struggle to remember their and our own sacred worth. Startle us, O oh God, with your truth. We long for the spark of love you have placed inside each one of us. Some of us understand that spark as small children, led to understand your love and experience your church from the moment we are born. Others can spend a lifetime straining to hear your call, yet you never cease calling, you never give up on us. Startle us, O oh God, with your truth that we are yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in hymn 413. And just as a reminder, all of the hymns can be found at the end of your order of worship. Come into God's presence singing Alleluia. Let's join together in the prayer of confession. Lord, you call us to work for a world where all will be fed and have dignity, but we become distracted by our own desires and fears of scarcity. You call us to seek justice and peace, but we become complacent in our privilege and self-righteousness. You call us to bring liberty to the oppressed, but we do not insist on freedom for all. Forgive us, dear Lord. Turn us to your ways by the presence of your spirit and by the power of your grace, so that we may be agents of your love and all may know your justice and peace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Friends, we now come to the time where we are passing the peace in this new way. Um, and so I want to extend the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be with each one of you this morning. And I'm going to say the names of those who are with us um, as I see them listed here. Um, so I want to say peace to Anna, peace to Ethel, peace to Harold and Jean, peace to Leslie, peace to Myla, peace to Russ and Phyllis. Um, and then also, as we see the names of folks who are showing up in the chat here, we're going to issue peace as well. So peace be um, 
with all of us from James and Sandra, from Georgia, from Liz, from, from Jenny, Pastor Jenny, from Stacy and Cigna, from Jonna, from Julia, sorry, sometimes it's hard for me to catch up here, uh, from Darian, from Lars, uh, from the Hammer family, from Caroline, from the Forvis family upstairs, and we're the downstairs chapter down here. Um, from Lisa, Lady, and Jim, from Katie, from Dawn, from Carol, um, from the Isel family, from Gary and Nancy, and from, from, <laughs> from the Wu family, and from, from Jen, uh, Jen Jensen. Friends, the peace of our Lord be with you. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Testify to us, O God, by the voice of your spirit. Put your law in our hearts, write your word in our minds, and show your will in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first lesson is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. together and together watch it grow and learn once more what we already know <clears throat> lift up your voice rejoice in what we found let every heart take refuge in the sound <clears throat> feel the walls around us tremble we will share Our song and dance and art This is how we touch the future How we touch a heart Tell your story to a child And they'll take it as their own This is how we learn we're not alone <clears throat> Lift up your voice Rejoice in what we found Let every Take refuge in the sound. Feel the walls around us tremble. We will surely bring them down and find ourselves on common. 
I begin to understand There are bridges we can only cross together hand in hand Soon we'll head on homeward and go our separate ways But these echoes will be dancing down our days Lift up your voice, rejoice in what we've found Well, good morning, everyone. I don't usually have a chance to um, speak uh, to the kids, um, but I'm so glad to be able to do that today. Um, and what I want to talk about is we have two scriptures this morning um, that Jenny is going to preach on, and I'm so looking forward to hearing her sermon. Um, but I just want to sort of give a tiny little reflection on um, them. So when Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians, he is trying to encourage them in the midst of their own struggles, and he tells them to live their life uh, in a way that is worthy of the gospel. Live their life in a way that is worthy of the gospel. So that's kind of one phrase. And then the text that we haven't heard yet that Jenny's going to read is this story that Jesus tells about all these different people that go in to work in the vineyard at different times. And then at the end of the day, they all get paid the same thing. And I want to talk about that for a second because I can just imagine if your house might be like mine is, which there's no guarantee that it is, so this is not an assumption, but in our house, um, there is a lot of effort, let's just say, that is put into managing this whole idea of what is fair. What is fair? we have that all lined up we've got spreadsheets we've got um, ways of keeping track of that and i can tell you even with the most meticulous management of what is fair it always falls short there is always an extra cookie that got lost somewhere along the way there is a room that didn't get cleaned when somebody thought that it was going to get cleaned. There were chores that got assigned to someone and not to someone else. There is always a list of what went wrong in the world of what is fair. But in reading the text again, I want to tell you uh, something that I noticed in the text, something that I noticed in the text, and I just want to chat about this for a sec. So, some of you might remember playing this game, right? So this is, by the way, not my favorite game, but obviously it's been well loved in this house because we've played it a lot. Um, so we've played this game a lot because one of my children, we won't mention that person's name, that is that person's favorite game. And every time uh, that individual plays that game, he wins. He wins every single time right? So he thinks it's fair when we play that game. Hold that thought a second. Now we've got this. This is a very complicated puzzle, very hard to do. It's also been well loved in this house. Notice the box. It is how many pieces? 1,000 pieces here. And when this puzzle comes out, it's not a game, but we have another person in this house who gets this done uh, in a very short amount of time. And I can tell you it's not the same person who often wins at Monopoly. I have a third game, but it's upstairs, so I'm not going to be able to get it, but I think that you get the point. Uh, and the thing that I noticed when I was rereading this parable is that the owner of the vineyard, when he talks to the people who haven't gone in yet, he says, why are you standing here? And they say to him, nobody 
hired us. And that's when the owner changes his perspective. And what I see in that text is that there are ways that we can all measure fairness, but it takes the eyes of someone who loves us to be able to figure out what we can do and what we're good at and to put us not in the space of what's fair, but of what is loving and what is generous. And that's part of what I'm sure you all experience, maybe in your homes, when somebody says to you, well, we know that you're not good at this, so let's maybe move you from that chore to this other chore, because that's where you have a little bit more joy, have a little bit more understanding. And sometimes that can be frustrating when we're trying to measure what's fair. Um, but as we learn in our text today, and as we learn in life every single day, um, that fairness um, only exists, um, it doesn't exist in the way that we want it to exist, um, but when we are seen by the one who loves us, then we are brought from the world that transcends what is fair. So friends, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you do not leave us in the land of what is fair, but you bring us to the land of what is true. In your name, amen. Friends, our second scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, starting in chapter 1, verse, or sorry, chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. He went out about nine o'clock and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three o'clock he did the same. At about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around and said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one's hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there comes times as a preacher where you have to completely rewrite your sermon the day before. And this was one of those weeks. So I was 10 years old when the very first female Supreme Court justice was appointed. I was 22 when the second Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed. And by the age of 49, two more had been named to the court. Four women, all in my lifetime, three of whom served at the same time, the highest number of women on the bench in history, until Friday evening, when a true icon of my age who had come to be known as the notorious RBG, passed away surrounded by her family. Now, Justice Ginsburg has said that she is frequently asked, <clears throat> when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And her answer is always, when there are nine. 
And when people have been surprised by her answer, she says, there have been nine men and nobody's ever raised a question about that. Now, I don't believe that there will ever come a time in the history of our nation when there will be nine women on the Supreme Court. And I don't know if that's realistic or pessimistic. I don't know if there ever comes a time that when there's even one more woman than men that there isn't gonna be a debate about balance and fairness, especially when it comes time to name a new nominee. And I fully own that my lens as a woman definitely impacts how I feel about the passing of this legendary woman. A woman to whom I owe my ability to have the same protections under the law as my father, my husband, and even my son. Because when I was born, the young lawyer, Ruth Ginsburg, was still two years away from stepping forward to argue her first case before the Supreme Court demanding that discrimination on the basis of gender was unconstitutional. The impact that Justice Ginsburg has had on my life as a 21st century woman is truly immeasurable. And so it is with that lens of a woman that I also read our parable for today. See, for many, this story of the landowner and his hired day laborers sits hard because we sympathize with someone who has worked for eight or nine hours to see another person getting paid the exact same as them. It's a parable that strikes us as unfair. However, for women who struggle even today for pay equity, for people of color who are statistically more likely to be laid off first when budgets get tight and have much lower lifetime earning averages, and for those who work in service professions and nonprofits like teachers, social workers, dental hyg hygienists, they know that they will never earn a pay equal to what people in the for-profit world will make in their lifetime. And so this parable creates very different feelings around what is fair. So what our parable and Justice Ginsburg have in common is that sometimes what is just isn't fair, especially for those in power. And the landowner's answer to the laborer who challenged the fairness of him being paid the same as the one hour worker was to call him out and to say, when you've been blessed, your perception of what is fair can be very skewed. See, that labor was not only upset that he wasn't earning more, he was upset that the other person was getting the same. And you might be tempted to believe that the man who worked all day deserved more pay because he worked longer. We may even go so far as to infer that the man was hired first because of his superior skill and his talent or his strength. Maybe, that could be true. However, it's also just as likely, and honestly, from my perspective, probably more likely, that he was hired first because he looked right, or he had the right religion or race. And he certainly was the right gender. See, nothing in our parable tells us that those who were hired in the morning deserved to be hired when they were versus the ones who were hired later. Maybe they were just lucky. And when we speak of this gospel as being one of justice, we have to wrestle with this concept of fairness. Because Jesus tells the disciples over and over and over again the same thing that he says at the end of this passage. The last will be made first. The least will be favored most. Those who find their treasure on earth will not find it in heaven. 
God's promise isn't that everything will be fair. God's promise is one of mercy and reparation of a world made just. And what justice looks like in heaven can depend a lot on what it looks like for you on earth. And so that's why we have to hold the concept of fairness rather loosely. And we need to be honest with ourselves about our own blessings and privileges. Because a more godlike understanding of justice would be to believe that a court that had all male justices for 191 years would need to see that same court have all female justices for 191 years before we could even begin to see a mixed gendered court as fair. But Jesus' hope for us is that we are going to seek to move beyond our own perspectives and to strive for justice for one another, to bring one another up instead of holding one another back. That we would hear this story and side with the man who showed up ready, willing, and able to work and then had to sit for eight hours while person after person was hired instead of him. That we would rejoice in the generosity of the landowner who hires him at the end of the day and yet pays him all that he will need to feed and care for himself. That we would read this story and rejoice in the benevolent mercy of God. Now, Justice Ginsburg died on Rosh Hashanah, which is one of the highest holy days in the Jewish calendar. On Rosh Hashanah, they open the Book of Life, or in modern terms, the Book of Lives Well Lived. And they reflect on how they themselves live and the impact that their lives have had on their community and on the amount of good that they have created. They used the lives of those who came before as examples and sources of wisdom and value. And when someone dies on Rosh Hashanah, they are called a zadik, which means a person of great righteousness. And Justice Ginsburg wrote, do something outside yourself, something to repair tears in your community something to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is, living not for oneself, but for one's community. So friends, whether you have served the cause of justice for a lifetime or only for an hour, God's grace and mercy are yours. So may the memory of the notorious RBG be a blessing to us all and an example of a life well lived. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, as we recall and celebrate and enjoy the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, may we also celebrate those like the landowner in our parable today, who see justice in raising up those on the margins, the poor, the sick, those who suffer, that our calling in this world is not particularly to fairness, but to justice and that it is in justice we will find your mercy and love, most dear. In your name we pray, amen.
When the Lord redeems the very least, we will rejoice. When the hungry gather for the feast, we will rejoice. We will rejoice with gladness. We will rejoice. All our days we'll sing to God in praise. We will rejoice when the Lord restores the sick and weak. We will rejoice when the earth is given to the meek. We will rejoice. We rejoice with gladness we will rejoice all our days we'll sing to God in praise we will rejoice when the Lord revives the world from death we will rejoice when the word of God fills every breath we will rejoice, we will rejoice with gladness, we will rejoice. And all our days we'll sing to God in praise, we will rejoice. When the Lord returns in victory, we will rejoice. When we live in glorious liberty, we will rejoice. We will rejoice with gladness. We will rejoice. All our days we'll sing to God in praise. We will rejoice. Friends, let us give thanks for this morning's offering. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have given each of us so much. As we think and reflect on this parable today, we respond in gratitude to just how much we have been given and we seek to operate within the world towards mercy and justice. And we ask that you would use these resources to confirm that work. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Creator, say your holy ghost. Let's join together in the prayers of intercession. On this Sunday, we pray for a way to be present in the middle of suffering in an honest and authentic way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for our world. We pray for the UK and Europe as they struggle to develop a united front against the virus. We pray especially for India, where the spread is beginning to challenge the medical facilities. We ask for calm hearts and clear thinking in the face of this ongoing challenge. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. 
We pray for our country, mourning the loss of leadership in the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We ask for clear minds as we struggle to remain united in all things. We ask for hearts that would look to understand those who are different. We ask that we would know how to reach out to one another. Because of the changes in our climate, we need to come together, and we ask that we would be able to do this by the power of the Spirit. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray especially this morning for those in our community that need your comfort and healing. We pray for those recovering from illness. We pray for those who are struggling to keep businesses alive. We pray for those that are living with reduced resources. And we pray especially this morning for Anna, who is recovering at home after illness. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For the next part of our prayer, please offer your specific prayer requests in the chat. And if you're on the phone, uh, please speak your prayer request, knowing that God can hear you even though we can't at this moment. Praising God for cleaner air. Lord, hear our prayer. For Katie's mom who fell yesterday and broke her ankle, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For Carolyn, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Now we join our voices together across the city and even farther to pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you are invited to go out into this week in peace, 
remembering the announcement that we will have our congregational meeting after the service next week. So just to keep that in mind, but also to keep in mind this idea and this important truth that the world of mercy and justice sees with such a bigger eye and with such a greater heart than the world that measures that which is fair. So go into the world in peace, surrounded by the love of God our Father, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen.